Today we're joined by Cam Irvine of Irvine Wormborn Financial Planners. These guys are lifestyle financial planners. That means they work with you, your goals, your dreams, and your timeline. Today we discuss five whys, the importance of time, and the importance of regular reviews. I hope you enjoy the show, and if you do, please do subscribe. Great to have you uh, on here with us. Thanks for having me. It's cool. a pleasure to be here. Excellent, excellent. Now, um, today we want to kind of cover off a few areas of essentially what is lifestyle financial planning and really get to understand where can we start this process with clients. So, um, Ken, please kick us off. I mean, what is lifestyle financial planning? Yeah, it's, it's actually what it sounds like. So if you just break it down by individual words, it's figuring out what somebody's lifestyle is that they desire, what they want to live, where they want to be, how they want to spend their time, and then putting a financial plan around that so that they understand what they need to do to get from point A to point B and be comfortable in this kind of situation that they want to be in. Okay, great. So, so what are perhaps, when someone's starting with this, right, what are the main questions that they need to be able to answer themselves? they probably want to start by asking themselves at least what's important to them. And the reason for that, it's a little bit more qualitative. It's hard to answer. But if I tell you what's really important to me, that might be totally different than what's important to you. So doing a bit of self-investigation and discovery on what you actually care about. There's all kinds of exercises that you can do this, but a very simple version is just kind of answering the question, why do I care about money? And it doesn't mean that you only care about money, that money is the only thing in your life, but what does that actually represent and what can you do with it? What does it enable? And once you have a few answers from there, at least you understand a bit more about what your priorities are. What are your values? What do you kind of want to be incorporated into your life? From there, you start to figure out a bit more of the specifics, what kind of goals you have, how do those values actually get played in, so for example, if somebody really appreciates travel in their life, well, what does travel look like? Where do you want to go? When do you want to go there? How frequently? How do you want to travel? Do you want to go first class or do you want to kind of do a backpack through Southeast Asia for six months? There's all different styles. And you can flesh these things out more and more and get into the granular detail to figure out, oh, this is actually what I'm looking for. From there, you start to put some numbers around it there are all kinds of tools that can do this and software, a financial planner can do it, or if you know how to build it out in a spreadsheet, that also works. And then the last bit is just figuring out what's gonna enable you to do that. Maybe it's a combination of property or shares or managed funds or businesses that you own. There is not one way to go about it. There's millions of ways, maybe even more than that. And so it gets a little bit confusing when you hear it as, oh, this is the best way. Well, that might be true. You can put numbers around saying what is best, but the best thing doesn't really incorporate your life and the things that matter to you. So there's a bit of subjectivity in an otherwise kind of numerical field. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, and do you think, you know, the questions you were just um, going through there, in particular around the travel, do you think that most people, or do you think many people at all, will actually go to that depth of planning for themselves if they're not going through a formal process with, with you? Like, is it, that seems like it would be quite an unnatural thing that someone just sits down and writes one day. You, know? you, you nailed it. Uh, so most people won't, but that's not to say that they can't. It's just that it's very difficult to ask yourself those kinds of questions and really interrogate what you care about to that level of depth. If you can do that, that's great. but. Because most people can't, that's where a financial planner or advisor adds a lot of value. So in theory, you can do all of that on your own. In theory, we could all be billionaires. We could all be really healthy and in great shape. And I know that broccoli is more healthy than a bowl of ice cream, but I still have my fair share of ice cream in life. <laughs> so there's the difference between what you can do in theory and what you do in reality. And an advisor will know that and help somebody investigate it and tease out those questions to figure out, okay, now that we've asked the question, how do we kind of go to the next question? What's underneath that? And then what's underneath that? So we're just slowly peeling back the layers. So in terms of just being kind of a broker and saying, 
a Wolf of Wall Street, hey, I've got a hot stock for you right now. It's a lot more about kind of understanding what you care about and then moving your life in line with those kinds of things. And that's where a good accountant can help, a good solicitor, a good advisor. There's all kinds of people that can do that, but it's not always recognized at the start. So yeah, you've asked a really good question. <laughs> Um, where you say there, you know, the different advisors, um, and again, I agree with that, but it's, um, you know, can that sometimes be too many chefs spoiling the broth? Or I would imagine there need to be some real um, uh, synchronization between those kind of coaches and advisors, would there? Yeah, absolutely. And you've nailed it again where you can have too many chefs in the kitchen. There can be too many people that are trying to accomplish the same thing and that starts to muddle it. So having a division of labor makes that much more clear, but also not just a division of labor, having some kind of good coordination and communication behind that whole team mm. so that people understand what role they're playing and what role they're not playing specifically. I'm not an accountant. That's not something I can do and I don't want to. So I'm going to leave that to the professionals that do it really well. Same things go for being a solicitor, legal issues, I'm not the person you need to talk to there. I'll talk to you about the things that make sense and that I'm trained and qualified to do, but I also wanna make sure that I'm communicating with the solicitor and the accountant and other people that are part of their lives, their insurance brokers, their mortgage advisors, and make sure that we're all kind of moving towards the same goal and the same mission, as opposed to just, I've done my bit and then passing that off to somebody else. Because once we have a more integrative and holistic picture, it's easier to see how we're working together or if something is out of line with those overall goals. Yeah, great. It's the, um, I was thinking as you were answering that, the, you know, you name the, uh, the professionals that people will often work with, but uh, we sometimes forget about the, um, uh, that, the mate down the pub, um, you know, with all the advice. They're a tax expert, an investment expert, tell you what works and what doesn't. Um, I came across this thing a while ago, of the, uh, the trusted advisor. Uh, the trusted advisor is absolutely two parts. <laughs> you can be trusted, you can have good intentions, but you may not be uh, at the point of being a, a good advisor. Um, you may not be qualified to do so, what have you. And it can be on the other side as well. Um, a slimy advisor is not a trusted one. Yes. So uh, it's about getting the right, um, that right mix of being both trusted and a capable advisor. And it can be harder to find than some people think because it, we can conflate those ideas. We might think, oh, well, my brother-in-law does this, so I'll listen to him. And that's where the trust comes into it. Or like you said, the slimy advisor, which quite frankly, you don't really want to work with that person anyway, but getting this right balance and recognizing who's in that position where they have your best interest and they know what is actually best. They can verify that as opposed to having a feeling or an intuition about it. And mm. It's kind of difficult to come by sometimes. Yeah. And so before people embark on this journey, I mean, is there a, is there a kind of status quo as to where people might be? Um, the reason I ask this question is I know when we first met and we were chatting about, you know, well, what are my goals and what do I want to achieve? And you highlighted to me that, um, you know, my success looked like handing an inheritance over to my uh, children when they're in their mid 60s, which when you spell it out like that sounds ridiculous. So, but I thought I was consciously working towards a plan. Now, do you come across this? Hopefully I wasn't the, other, the only fool. <laughs> no, you, you're, it's a lot more common than people realize. And part of the reason is because this is one of those gray areas that just doesn't get looked at very much. We might feel like we have a plan in life, and to some degree we do, but that doesn't mean that we don't have blind spots. I'm a financial planner. Do I have blind spots in my life? You bet I do. There's all kinds of things I don't know anything about, but that's where I need a team of other individuals and professionals, specifically trusted advisors, to give me input and for me to be receptive to that because they're going to be able to help me get guidance in areas that I can't find on my own. So all the time you'll find people that have specific goals that might actually be clashing with other kinds of goals or values that they have. You might find the person that really wants to invest in company X, but they really want sustainability. And then they find out that those aren't really linked. 
They might want to be able to hand something down to their children, but without thinking it through, they hand over a big chunk of wealth to their children and do it maybe very late in life, once the kids no longer need it. Maybe the grandkids could use it, or maybe their kids could have used it in their 30s or 40s. Maybe it's something else where they feel like the giving tree, and they build up a massive empire and estate, but they keep giving it too early to the kids, and then they end up with nothing for themselves in their older ages. Shame, guilt, and embarrassment are three incredibly common feelings when it comes to money, but because they're so common and they're considered negative, most people aren't willing to admit to that, and it's very uncomfortable to dig that stuff up, but once it's there, it's much easier to pave a way forward. Mm -hmm. So understanding, hey, this is a little bit of uncomfortable territory, but because it's uncomfortable, we're on the precipice of something really good, so we can start building a better foundation for it. Yeah, excellent. And so, you know, what what we want with these videos all the time is that somebody watching or listening to it on Spotify can um, take from this and start the process themselves. So mm -hmm. some kind of tangible value for their investment in time listening. So if someone was to start on this process and they wanted to give it a go themselves, I mean, look, Kiwis with a number eight wire, right? We're gonna, we're gonna do it ourselves first. Yes. Um, so what would be a, a, the three steps that someone should do to start to get their wheels in motion? Okay, a few things. Number one, do a bit of self-investigation. Figure out what is important to you. And once you have that, that's a bit of your North Star. So now you've got a direction that you're headed. And again, that may not be easy. So use somebody else to get to ask those questions of you. Because it's not easy to just say, hey, what is important to me? Reach out to your closest friends and family members because they might not be trusted advisors, but they probably do know what's important to you and they can give you a little bit of input. Just quickly on that point, so you're looking at what's truly important to me. Now, is that outside the realm of success, money and finance? So, because some people what are driven mm -hmm. by this image of success that they pursue. But actually, it might be the stuff outside of that that is the real driver. It could be the travel, the providing for other people, the, the legacy they leave. So is it out of that, um, you know, devoid of the context of finance? Correct. No. It, it will include some context of finance, but it also needs to be bigger picture stuff. Mm -hmm. And again, if you kind of do a series of five why questions, hey, I want to make sure that I have a, a wealthy position in life. Okay, well, why? Well, because I want to make sure that I'm okay and can give something to my kids. Okay, why? It's because there's always an answer underneath that initial answer. So the money is important, but the money is really just a tool. We need to know what we're using that tool for. A surgeon doesn't use a scalpel because they just like scalpels. They use it for a very specific purpose. So investigating that is going to be crucial to kind of getting at the answer. So look at the whole life. That's what you're really treating. Mm. And the five whys. I love that. Mm. Dig deeper. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Once you have that, then you want to start on the financial part of it. What do you spend right now? You may need a budget. You also may not need a budget, which is unusual to hear from a financial planner. But now you've got all kinds of budgeting apps and software that make it so easy. You can download it and then it's going to filter all that information for you anyway. You find out what you spend. If you don't know what your retirement looks like, just assume that you're spending the same that you are today. And realistically, that might change over time. But again, this is a starting point. This isn't an ending point. Mm -hmm. So once you know what you're spending, then you can start to use different softwares. Just Google it. There's all kinds of tools. One's called Obelix, another one called Portfolio Visualizer. Those are differing degrees of complexity. You can look up some spreadsheet online. Uh, I think. Microsoft Excel even has a retirement planner built into it as a template. So just open it up and explore that. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. And then in terms of picking the investments, here's where a lot of people get hung up. And they do that because they have strong regret aversion. They don't wanna make the not perfect choice. So they end up making no choice at all and it hinders their progress. It doesn't have to be a perfect choice. The most important thing is to get started. And then you can figure out better choices as you go through time. So if you're confused about, should I do it in property? Should I do funds? Should I do this? That's all good to consider, but start with one and life will actually be a teacher along the way. 
you don't need to be a perfectionist because it's going to prevent you from moving forward. Mm. On that note, how long do you think would be a, an ideal minimum? Um, I mean, if you're 55 and going, oh, I really should think about retirement soon. Mm. Um, or, you know, what's, what do you think is your minimum amount of time to get this right? There isn't a minimum. And that's a very unsatisfying answer because I know we want hard rules. We want to understand, hey, what, when can I leave this to? The truth is when you're planning for your future, it's much like planting a tree. The best time to do it was 10 years ago. The second best time is today. And so you really, the earlier you start on it, the easier you make your life later on. So you're doing your future self a huge advantage the earlier that you start. If you are 55 and starting today, you might still be right on track. Mm. But again, that's where it does depend on kind of somebody's personal assets, their expenditures, how they want to live their life. If you live your lifestyle on a very cheap budget, well then 55 is probably fine to start. But if you live on a more expensive and lavish diet, well then 55 might be a little bit more difficult and you could still get there but maybe at the cost of other things. And what I mean is maybe you can't retire the day you turn 65, Mm. but that doesn't mean you can never retire. Maybe you just have to delay it a couple of years. It's all about kind of compromise, which is such a dirty word, people hate it. But the truth is it's a negotiation on the things that you care about. It's a tug of war between, hey, I wanna do this, but I also wanna do this. So which one am I kind of willing to put to the back burner for the sake of this other thing? Yeah, excellent. Thank you. And so people have um, they've gone and asked themselves the deep questions. They've mm-hmm. understood what they want to achieve. Um, they've then got started in some way, shape or form. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else you could add to that that you might encourage people to do? Yeah, I would probably say that it's a continuous process. Even though you've gone through the majority of the planning, that upfront time, and that's the most important starting point, it's not as though you're done you want to continue doing that over time. And the reason for that is even though a person's values will be relatively stable throughout their life, studies have shown longitudinally it will change at some point. If you look at the values of a 22-year-old, they usually don't reflect that of a 62-year-old. They're not the same, and that's because of life change. So continue to revisit that at a period that works comfortably for you. Probably at least once a year. You could do it more, you could do it less. But if you leave it for every 10 years, That's how you start to veer off path. It's kind of like if you're driving to another destination and you don't look at a map or a GPS, you could get pretty far off track. But if you keep checking in or looking at road signs, you make sure that you're staying on the right path. So I would say that would be number one. Number two, back to what you said, a trusted advisor. A lot of people don't like the idea of paying for a service like that, which is totally understandable, but understand that There's good value for money in that. And data have shown this, all kinds of studies all over the place. I can speak to the financial advisor profession and what that looks like, but my understanding is it's the same thing in other kinds of fields as well. So making sure that you are talking to somebody that knows what they're talking about and can plot along in that process. Those are probably two really big ones. Um, And I think if you do those, you're probably 80% of the way there anyway. Maybe you're not 100%, but to be honest, 80% is probably the good enough. And so you've, you've done what you need to do for the most part. Excellent. Perfect. Well, look, that is fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, helping us here with this, uh, uh, this advice, because it is certainly one of those things where our happiest clients, we know this, they have a plan. They know what they want to achieve, even if it's in 20 years, 30 years. Uh, they feel like they get satisfaction out of knowing they're working towards something. So I, I love it when all of our clients can have good plans like this. And so hopefully this has helped the listeners um, start the process for their own plan. Hopefully so. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the idea. If not, give it another listen and let's see if that gives more motivation. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Cheers, Ken. Thanks, Rick. Hey there, Kiwi business owners and entrepreneurs. I'm Rick Thorpe, the host of Sidekick TV. This is the podcast focused on the finances that affect you. We'll be bringing you experts, insights, the people out there in the field doing this and the current issues that could be affecting you. 
Please subscribe to stay tuned and up to date.